Welcome to this uh, last session of the Deloitte Fast 50 on the corporate venturing. During this session, we will take a different perspective than the, the ones that you had so far. We'll take the perspective of the investors, the financial investors, the private equity, the venture capitalists. Corporate venturing is sometimes seen as the alliance between the pirates and the Navy. Uh, that's uh, an image that's taken by uh, Dado van Petegem and Omar Mahout in their book on corporate venturing. And I like that idea because the, uh, the Navy can be seen as uh, the, the representative of the, of the corporates, which are well organized, a lot of FTEs, a lot of processes, governance, compliance, procedures. And the scale-ups, they can be seen as the pirates, which are agile, flexible, they have clear purposes, they can go fast. How do uh, financial investors look at this? Do they value uh, a corporate venturing? Do they, do they see this as a, as a threat for, for, for them? Uh, and uh, how do they see an exit? Is, uh, for instance, an exit by an IPO possible? To discuss about these interesting topics, I have three distinguished experts with me. First, I have uh, Michel Gabriel, which I'm uh, delighted to, to welcome. Michel is a partner at Deloitte Monitor. I have also um, Duco Sikinger, who is a managing partner at Fortino Capital. And last but not least, the author of the book that I uh, refer to, Omar Mahout, who is a professor at the Antwerp Management School and uh, partner head of digital at Nova Reperta. Myself, I'm Benoit van den Nova. I'm head of listing at Euronext Brussels, and I will be your host for, the, uh, uh, for, for this session. So let's start with uh, Michel. Michel, how do you see corporate venturing drive growth in the overall ecosystem these days? Thank you, Benoit, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening with you gentlemen. Uh, to come back on your question, I think more broadly uh, we can see a shift uh, for corporates, uh, where before they really had a mindset of really building everything themselves, uh, doing everything themselves, a real make uh, mentality. We see a shift towards more corporates, uh, towards more partnerships, let's say. Corporates really going into partnership. And that also translates towards corporate venturing. Actually, before, when corporates were setting up corporate ventures, we could see that they were already in a kind of takeover modus towards startups and scale-ups, really looking into one-to-run uh, relationships, whereas now we see that those corporate venturing setups are really evolving into a multitude of relationships with different startups, with different scale-ups, and even including different corporates. And there as well, the objectives of going purely to looking for innovation, they also really transcend in looking into societal and economical challenges where they can bundle their forces and really solve uh, those challenges together. And they look more also for benefits for the entire ecosystem, uh, not just for themselves, but really looking into sustainable partnerships. And that is, according to me, how uh, corporate venturing really contributes mm -hmm. to sustainable growth for the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It remains, of course, a challenge to find the right uh, distribution in terms of revenue, to find the right model there. But if they can find incremental value for all the different partners, well, I guess there's no reason not to go into it. Okay, thanks. Do you want to react on, on this one, uh, Duco or uh, Omar? I fully agree. I mean, to make it very tangible, uh, Michel, take the load. If you take a company on board, a small startup, you can really scale it. Nothing can scale it more than you as a company globally. As such, so you're the biggest accelerator possible for small companies. Yes, it's a challenge, number of things, mm -hmm. but in terms of bringing scale, there is no question about mm -hmm. what you can do for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During the, the, the afternoon, we saw di different types of uh, collaborations in the framework of a corporate venturing. So we had a strategic collaboration between ByteFlies UCB. Yeah. We had the corporate incubators of uh, uh, ABNB, for instance, with Schoolmill. And finally, we had the joint market access of Deloitte and Silverfin. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference uh, amongst the these three? Of course, the last one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, they are all very nice examples, indeed, of, of uh, very successful collaborations. But a bit to build on what uh, Omar just said. Indeed, I think uh, where we really see a win-win situation is uh, with Deloitte and Silverfin, <laughs> uh, where Deloitte, instead of taking the attitude of building everything themselves, uh, really trying to look for the critical capabilities uh, themselves, they reached out to a partner, to a startup, to a scale-up, where they bundled forces. They had the critical capability. 
they could bring it in to really fulfill a need uh, on the client side. And on the other hand, of course, Silverfin could uh, really merit from the, the professional uh, client portfolio mm -hmm. that Deloitte got to offer them. So I think it's a nice example where we as well as Deloitte are maybe a more uh, robust, uh, let's say corporate, a bit uh, less uh, flexible from time to time. We can scale very fast mm -hmm. uh, by uh, joining forces with mm -hmm. uh, a company like Silverfin. Okay. And Omar, do, do, you, do you see uh, any form of exclusivity requirement from the corporate towards the, the, the scale-up? Because, I mean, uh, scale-up, it's agile, it can go into partnership with di different uh, corporates. And once the, the corporate uh, starts the collaboration with the scale-up, uh, does that limit its freedom to, uh, to contract with uh, other parties? That's the one billion dollar question, of course, mm -hmm. uh, Benoit. Uh, Deloitte Silverfin is a very good example. Eh? I mean, that's uh, almost magic happening. But the load gives the freedom to Silverfin to grow. If tomorrow you would limit them in their growth, mm -hmm. and that happens, I think you're I'm not saying an exception, but usually the bigger party who has the upper hand will ask some kind of limitations in there. So it can also limit your growth in there. But that mindset of being open and really have much more growth, like you're doing with Silverfin, is not exception, but it's also not a rule. So yes, that's the limitation of corporate venturing, that you can have a partner which doesn't want that, and therefore will get exclusivity for uh, forever or a number of years of certain markets. Yeah. And, and in your mind, does the, the corporate venturing entail uh, uh, systematically a, an equity stake? Or, or is that the preferred route that you see? Or uh, simple collaborations uh, based on a contract, is, is that sufficient? Uh, in the past, equity was the number one because you want to own it. Eh? You want to have a stake in there. Today, you, you see that it's not the case anymore because you're building a value chain and ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to own everything. Mm -hmm. So collaboration becomes more important. Equity is still part of it, but it's not the first driver for collaboration, yeah. in my experience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that brings me to, uh, to, to, to Duco. Huh? And, and the question, how, how do you differentiate yourself uh, from, from a corporate venturing fund? Because you, 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 you have specialty, you, you have knowledge about specific sectors, so you will help the, 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 the companies, the investees that you have in your portfolio, as would do a, a corporate. So how, how, do, you, do you see a difference? I think the DNA of a corporate doing venturing is pretty different from a pure VC. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we seek to differentiate ourselves. I think we're a different animal. Uh, we have no association with any industry or corporate, so we are a more neutral body. We bring a lot of expertise, in our case, in software. Um, and I think a corporate brings other assets. Now, I think one has to distinguish a bit how corporates go about it. There are some corporates, I'm, for example, chairman of KPN, and we have a complete separate VC entity. They make their own decisions. What they do do, however, they seek some link with one of the operating divisions, but their investment process is completely independent mm -hmm. of the operating division. So they are after a good venture capital business, very similar to ours, but there are some linkage back. I do see different kinds of reasons to invest. Either a corporate wants to improve the supply side of their business, so then they say, you know, we want to help our suppliers grow new business models, or they invest in somebody who's going to help them create a new product, so it's an expansion mm -hmm. of their R&D, which is, you know, very interesting, or they want to have a different go-to-market channel, mm -hmm. you know, be prepared. And, and that then leads to complete different questions as the future of the companies involved. Uh, I think competitors will be a bit apprehensive. That's what we often see. So what I see in my VC portfolio is that we have a lot of corporates that become customers and big customers, and they're very keen that we don't sell the company just without telling them. Mm. And we're in the process of selling. We have sold many of our VC companies to corporates, actually, mm. and we continue to do so. And that works very well. You know, we are a feeding ground for them. We accompany those companies. They are a customer. They are a partner. Uh, for them to take 10% equity, KPN does that. And they love it because they make a good return on that. But in the scheme of things, the return KPN makes on the VC portfolio is negligible. Mm. And so the real question always is, why do we do this? But what I observe is that a lot of corporates become early involved as a customer or partner and eventually they may just want to buy the whole company and, and then it makes a difference for them. Mm. To buy a stake of 10, 15%, it may keep them a bit more abreast, mm. but again, a lot of the ventures are very apprehensive because they don't want to advantage one company over the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, and, and if you, you have a, a corporate that's insisting on, on, on getting that, that kind of... Um, uh, no. 
Actually, yeah. I think that corporates have moved away from we need to have equity. No, they want to have access to what the company does. They want to mm -hmm. be informed, abreast. You know, they don't need to own 10, 15 percent to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And they're very open. Often they know exactly which competitors also are partners or customers. Mm -hmm. And it's a fair game who's going to buy the company. Mm -hmm. And in our first case, Zentric was sold to a corporate in the United States. But I know that some of the sort of competitors stay the customer. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You know, we live in a different world, I yeah. think, in that respect. OK. And, and let's take uh, uh, another example where you have a, a scale up which has already uh, a, a relationship with a corporate, a strong relationship in uh, kind of a corporate venturing uh, relationship and they knock on your door for, for a new financing around? Is, is, will you take that into account? Oh, we'll easily look at that as long as the corporate has bought themselves into the company as any other investor. If there are special strings attached for the corporate, mm -hmm. it becomes less attractive. And, and that is implicitly mm -hmm. an answer to the question. You know, corporates that want to sort of indulge themselves with all kind of strings attached will reduce the value of the company implicitly and therefore make it less attractive for the entrepreneurs. So you see the entrepreneurs always juggle, yeah, we'd like to have the entrepreneurs at the table, but equity, you know, mm -hmm. could make stuff more complex. But, you know, it does happen and, and, it, and it works very well. Mm. So I think it just depends on the situation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, so sometimes what we hear also is that, uh, well, the, the, there are strong commitments of the corporate in order to, to get access to, uh, to, to the client base, to get access to the, to the product management teams. Um, and uh, do, do you play the, the role of a kind of referee between the scale-up and, and the corporate sometimes? Uh, I think, because yeah, I, I would not let that happen, what you just yeah. described. Corporates can become partner, but then they should, you know, play the game of being mm. part of the board and their representatives on the board should represent the interest of the company, not of the shareholders. Mm. You know, vital different mm. topic yeah. in corporate yeah. governance land. So to say to a corporate, you get a stake in the company and have access to product marketing, I would not want that because then I would say maybe there is value flowing away to the corporate that I'm unaware of. So mm. no, they can be a partner and that should be arm's length. Mm. And the partnership as a customer, for example, can come with equity and that's fine, but it should all be very transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's uh, because otherwise, imagine that they are the corporates. I mean, no entrepreneur would want that because they don't know what happens to that information. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's not very common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, what, what I, what in, in preparing this um, uh, the, this panel, I, 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 I found out that that sometimes, um, well, the, the corporates don't deliver on their promises, and then uh, when the the exit time comes, well, they, they value very very low the the, the company because. Uh, the, the promises or, or the, the business plan does not uh, proceed uh, because, uh, well, the, what was promised by, by, the, by the corporate wasn't done. And so the, the, well, the growth in the market, for instance, was not achieved. And uh, um, uh, I, I imagine that, that you go for, for very strict contracts between the corporate and, and the, and the scale-up in, in the partnership, or how, how do you yeah, handle this? You know, uh, but we live in a day that contracts are of some value, but not much either. In other words, if a corporate has committed to something and it doesn't happen, you know, there's not much you can do to enforce that. And it happens very often because a business unit manager can be appointed elsewhere and then the successor may see it differently. Mm -hmm. So it may happen for very good reasons that there's a change of strategy and the corporate behaves differently. Uh, you know, for me, you should always anticipate it as an entrepreneur, like any customer, mm. you know, and, and the investment is often decided by Treasury or the CFO and the business interest being customer partner is, is yet another line manager. So you already see two parties, you know, being involved and they may have slightly different agendas. Mm. Okay. But that's, that's okay. As long as the startup feels it's to the benefit, you know, it's an open market. So. I think it really depends. You know, if the entrepreneur says, I need this customer because, for example, let's take the example of Silverfin and Deloitte, you could say that maybe KPMG or PwC would not recommend today Silverfin mm. because they know Deloitte is using it. I don't know. There may be an unwritten rule. We mm. don't know. But let's even imagine that's the case. That may still make sense for Silverfin to do that deal because it has brought them massive scale and scope. Mm. And later, they can always find their way back to the open market, but they've you know, gotten the scale and scope through the Lloyd. So that could be very valuable, even though it may at first you know, hinder them a little bit. Mm. Yeah. 
Okay, and let's take the the the, the, the exit. Huh? Uh, we, we've seen some corporate ventures uh, that uh, that uh, went to an exit, also through an IPO. Huh? Uh, Duco mentioned uh, the exit to to the corporate, but sometimes you have uh, companies which have a. Um, a venture with a, with a corporate that go public. We see it sometimes in, in life science. Uh, uh, last year we had Nixoa, uh, which had uh, Resmet as, uh, as one of its shareholders. Last week we had uh, on, uh, on Nasdaq uh, Rivian with Amazon, uh, which is uh, in, in the, the shareholding. How, how, what, what's your perspective on this, uh, Omar? In terms of exit, uh, corporations are less exit driven than venture capital. Eh? That's by definition the case mm -hmm. in there. But in terms of being a shareholder, uh, and do an IPO, I don't see any contradiction from my point of view. And often in the examples you're giving, it's not just corporate venturing in there, it's also we see in private equity. Eh? It's not a story of one or the other. Often you see when it brings value to the parties that you see both parties within the same boat, within the same equity. So I don't see it as any difference from that point of view in my experience. Okay. Well, I would like to, to thank you uh, for attending this, uh, the, this session. It was a real pleasure to, to moderate it. I would like to thank, uh, on your behalf, the, the three panelists of the day, Michel, Duco and Omar. It was a pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Stay safe and see you soon.